today we're talking about the hero that started it all, but maybe not the way that you remember him. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions, the show that takes you into detail about the things you think you know about comics. I'm your host, Scott Nicewonder, and I know that this episode is late before anybody says anything. We were going to come back last week. Last week was very crazy, so we're coming back this week. You had to wait an entire extra seven days before you could see my lovely face, but we're back. I'm also on a green screen, so anything could happen. Like this. So last week when this was supposed to come out, it was my friend Jordan's birthday, and he loves Superman more than any hero. He's Clark Kent in my phone, so I figured why not celebrate by diving into the history of Superman. Now we've tackled Superman before from his powers and all the crazy stuff he's been able to do to how his disguise is actually better than you give it credit for. Links in the description if you want to check out those episodes, I highly recommend it. Now for this episode we're going old school and I mean old school. You see this picture right here, most of you guys would recognize this as the first appearance of Superman and that is to an extent, yeah that's right. However, we're gonna go a whole five years before Action Comics number one to dive into a short story called The Reign of the Superman. This, my friends, is the original Superman, a short story written by Jerry Siegel and illustrated by Joe Schuster, the same guys behind this. So it's not just a coincidence that the names are the same. Now, this story is pretty interesting, however, because it is just words, there's not gonna be a lot of pictures for me to show you guys, so I apologize for that. Professor Ernest Smalley, a, an evil scientist, naturally, is looking for the next candidate for his newest scheme. He goes to the bread line where poor people go to get something to eat so they don't die, where he meets a man named Bill Dunn who he offers to buy him a new suit and give him a real meal, and now that I think about it, I don't know if he actually got a suit out of the deal. Hmm. But Dunn does follow Smalley back to his house to get that nice meal that he was uh, so generously offered. But looking inside Dunn's coffee was a chemical that Smalley put in there that made Dunn go dizzy and pass out. Smalley leaves the room to go get the butler, but when he comes back, Dunn is nowhere to be found. Dunn then starts hearing thoughts going through his brain that are not his own. He learns he can read minds, and after some other tests, he discovers that it's not just his mind that is amplified, it's his eyesight as well. In one of the weirdest scenes to read, for me personally, he looks up into the sky, views the planet Mars, and then watches a tree fight a beam of light because those are the aliens that are on the planet Mars. So all of this craziness exhausts him and he falls asleep and then overnight, his mind has somehow accumulated all of the knowledge of all of the things, except where the library is because the very first thing he does when he wakes up is he asks somebody where the library is. I feel like you should know that if you know everything. So he spends a good chunk of the story just conning people out of the money in their pocket, but he discovers, hey, why don't I just go hit up some casinos and make millions? So of course this catches the eye of the media who write about it in newspapers. Newspapers that Professor Ernest Smalley reads and gets kind of jealous that the person that he created essentially is getting all the attention instead of him since his original plan was to test it out on Dunn to see if it worked, then kill him, and then use the drug on himself so that he could be be the Superman. So irritated, Smalley then goes and writes up a letter, a strongly worded letter to the newspaper telling him that, yeah, Dunn, he's smart and all, but he's a threat. He is a guy who's gonna control the world because we can't do anything to stop him. He's super powerful. And he doesn't just say we need to stop the Superman. He says we need to kill him or else we are basically just handing the world over to him. And this is a really interesting point, and I will get back to that. I am casting so many shadows on my face. So Dunn shows up back at Smalley's house and Smalley's like, hey dude, you know, we could be like a team. You know, I'll take the rest of the drug that I have and then we could both rule the earth together. Uh, but of course, since Dunn reads minds, he knows that Smalley is really thinking, all right, once I take this drug, I'm just gonna kill Dunn. So they get into this big fight and the story kind of cuts off there. We don't know who's gonna win. The last main part of the story is about the letter that Smalley sent to the newspaper. A reporter by the name of Forrest Ackerman is assigned to the task to look into this letter to see if it has any factual facts in it. He goes to the home of Smalley, notices that there had been a struggle there and a huge pool of blood on the ground, but again, he has no idea whose it is, Dunn's or Smalley's, we don't know. He jumps into his car ready to head back to the newspaper station, is that what it's 
called? Probably not. And so he's gonna write up what he's found, but then he gets this sudden urge to turn around and drive in the opposite direction. He arrives at a building where he's greeted by a man who tells him to sit down, and as he does, the chair turns out to be a trap, strapping him in so that he can't move or get away. Ackerman asks the man if he is Smalley or Dunn, and the man really has to think about it because he refers to himself as the Superman. He doesn't remember a time being human, but as he thinks, he realizes, oh yes, I was Dunn at one time, and I killed Smalley. It's also revealed that Dunn had been putting evil thoughts into world leaders, trying to start a global war in which he could rule over the aftermath. But then the Superman starts to scream. He sees this vision of the future just a couple hours from now. He's no longer the Superman. He is Bill Dunn, sleeping in the park, nothing special about him. The drug that made him this way is worn off. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to synthesize the drug again, and the only man who knows how to make it is dead. He hits some buttons on the chair that trapped Ackerman and tells him that in 15 minutes, he'll be automatically released, and Dunn will be back in the breadline. Really cool, interesting story, and I really feel like there are some themes carried over from the original Superman to the relationship between Superman and Clark Kent in nowadays. Go with me on this. Lex Luthor hates Superman because he sees him as a threat. He sees a all-powerful being that can control the world if he wanted to, and there's nothing we could do about it because what can we do, right? He's Superman. Lex just wants everyone to acknowledge that Superman is more of a threat that we should protect against instead of a hero that we should praise. Now we all know that because of the way that Superman was raised, he's pretty much one of the most well-behaved superheroes of all time, even being called a Boy Scout very often. But this story, this original story, points to a world where Lex is kind of right. Dunn was just an ordinary, humble man who was given extraordinary powers, and the first thing he does is go on an evil rampage. First, all he wanted to do was make some money, but Smalley saw past that. He saw the potential and realized that people need to put Dunn down. They gotta kill him or else It'll be too late. So in this so in this story, the Superman did not get any sort of moral training. As soon as he got powers, he used them for personal gain. But think of this story as a world where Lex is kind of right. I mean, Smalley is still not a good guy. He did perform experiments on Dunn without his permission and then attempt to kill him and also try to rule the world. And that kind of also plays into it. Lex loves the spotlight. I mean, the best way I've heard it described is that, you know, Lex was once the most powerful man of all Metropolis, but then Superman moved in and he could either be, you know, the second fiddle to Superman or he could be the best supervillain because Lex refuses. He is incapable of being second to anyone. This is like how Smalley wanted to be the only Superman there was. So when he saw that Dunn was being written up in all the newspapers, he hatched a plan to kill him because nobody can have that much attention. Except me. What do you guys think? Does the reign of the Superman show a world where Lex Luthor is actually right to not trust Superman? Let me know in the comments. And now we move on to the very first trivia challenge of the new year. So next week we will be doing a top five episode all about the top five weight loss stories in comic books because that's, that's, that's like the number one resolution ever, I think, in all of existence. We're going to be revisiting some familiar faces, so stay tuned for that. But uh, remember that my top five episodes are not in any particular order, so with that being said, we're going to start with a little trivia about my number five pick for weight loss stories. So this week's trivia challenge is, what voluminous Asgardian of the Warriors 3 weighs over 1,400 pounds? If you know the answer or just want to take a guess, please leave it in the comments below. And if you're right, you could be featured on the show next week. So get started, you guys, on the weekly trivia challenge. <laughs> Now before we mosey on out of here, we do have a couple housekeeping announcements. The NerdSync podcast is back on iTunes and is subscribed to NerdSync Productions if you haven't already. I'm going to see you guys right here next week for more comic misconceptions, more things you thought you knew about comics. See ya. So the story goes that it's Christmas Eve and Batman's out patrolling the streets because crime and disaster are not inclined to observe holidays. He sees the bat signal light up and heads over to see what's up. Commissioner Gordon then says, no, it's okay, there's actually no crime. I just wanted to invite you in to spend Christmas Eve with the rest of us here singing some Christmas carols.